Welcome to the Project Endure Podcast, the place where we talk about life, endurance, persistence, perspective, and so much more. I'm Joe Rinaldi, and I'll be your host. Let's jump in. Before we get started, let me just say that we get it. Personal development can be hard, but you don't have to do it alone. Project Endure has been on a mission to create a supportive and inspiring community of people, all striving to be better together. Head down to the link in the show notes and join the Hard Things Club so that we can do hard things together. And if you're already a member, invite a friend and spread the love. Now, let's get to the episode. Welcome back to the Project Endure podcast, episode 121. We have myself, Joe Rinaldi, and we have a very, very, very special guest in the great state of New Jersey, Mike Harkins. Mike, how are you? Great, Joe. Thanks, and uh, I'm honored to be on part of the podcast. Of course, it was inevitable that this would happen at some point, and it just so happens that we are recording this podcast about two weeks after what I assume is one of the hardest things you've ever done. And we'll get to that later. I won't spoil anything. Uh, But to start off, I would love if you could just introduce yourself to the listeners who might not know who you are. Sure. Yeah. So to Mike Harkins, um, I reside in Haddon Heights, New Jersey, which is a stone's throw from uh, South Philadelphia where Joe's located. Um, I'm a father of three. I have twins that are nine years old, just turned nine. Um, and then I have another younger daughter who is seven. So it's been a uh, whirlwind of the last nine years, um, but nothing short of amazing and uh, continues to be amazing as they grow and as we grow as a family. So um, yeah, full-time job working in the uh, analytics risk management world, uh, which which pays the bills and is, and is uh fun to interact and, and meet folks, even if it's through Zoom. But uh, ultimately, my passion lies in the health and wellness space and just connecting with like-minded people um, as Joe and I, have, you know, you and I have connected. Absolutely. So before we hit record, we were talking about a mutual connection of ours, Todd Kuchia. And uh, Todd was episode 60 of this podcast. And it's so wow. funny because you guys have so much in common. And I think you probably realize that. But The first time I met you is very similar to the first time I met Todd. Uh, And Todd and I actually haven't met in person just yet. Um, (laughs) But the first time we virtually connected, I thought to myself, man, these guys like are nonstop. Like they're running everywhere. They're they're lifting. They're dads. They've got full-time jobs. Somehow Mike is like in every place all the time with everybody else I know. I don't know how he does it. So my question for you is, how do you do everything that you do? What does your schedule look like? Sure. I mean, that's a great question. So I, I would say the foundation of my life is built with consistency and obediency, um, mm-hmm. as well as prioritizing me time. So in order for that to happen, it, it starts early mornings. Um, I'm a full believer, as I know you are, with a 3 to 3.30 a.m. start. Um, And that just didn't happen over the past year. I mean, that's been rooted over the last probably seven or eight years um, where prior to that, so prior to having children, I I still was a firm believer of um, what I used to call a 5 a.m. crew, Mm -hmm. um, which was showing up to the gym at five o'clock every morning. So, you know, back then it was more of just getting after some weights, cardio, conditioning, running wasn't really in 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 the picture. So that it required a lot less effort in the morning. Really, it was just wake up. You know, um, I, I'm a firm believer too of prioritizing my day. So what I do when I wake up at three, three thirty, and even back then, say four, four thirty, taking a look at my calendar, right, for the day, for the week, um, did I miss any emails through the prior night from West Coast deliveries, um, and then feeling good and secure, like okay, great, I have a grasp mentally of my day. And where my day is going to go now, let's get after the me time, right? Um, and I'm also a firm believer in if you can get through the hardest part of your day in the morning, the rest of the day, whatever obstacles you come across are going to seem a lot easier to overcome, um, not just mentally, but even physically, 
right? Mm-hmm. So with with kids and a family and, you know, you're constantly, like you said, on the go. Um, one of the things is like, I want to be prepared both mentally and physically. So typical days obviously start very early. Um, I try to get my workouts in, you know, summertime right now, since they're out of school, I have a little bit more flexibility um, working remotely. But when they're in school, it becomes even more rigid of a schedule. Uh, because there's that priority to get home, help get them ready for school. I take them to school. My wife is a uh, occupational therapist, so she leaves every morning by 6.45. Um, so I usually have to be done all my sessions by 6.45, get them off to school, and then I start my day like officially. Um, and then from there, the roller coaster ride begins. So really, the, the priority prioritization of time is that morning window, say mm-hmm. from three till eight a.m. It's a five-hour window, so maximize it. Yeah, so I love that. I'm the same way. I could not imagine my life without a calendar. Uh, I don't know how people exist without calendars. Yeah. Uh, almost every minute of every day is scheduled out, and. Like you, I look at it first thing in the morning. I also look at it before I go to bed at night, make sure that I just have that image in my mind of what my day is going to look like. Um, and I think the the old adage, failing to prepare is preparing to fail, uh, applies in, in the circumstance where somebody is not actively managing their day and planning it out with intention. With that sure. being said, I think the next question a lot of people would uh, ask you is what time are you going to bed if you're getting up so early and doing all these things every day? Sure. Yeah, that that varies. There's no set, um, say bedtime, let's call it, because you know with kids that are you know less than ten years old, we we try to keep them on a schedule, obviously, which is hey, I, the goal is eight p.m., but let's be real, it never happens. Um, so that eight to nine p.m. window is you know, playing referee, trying to get people ready for bed, plan them the next day, um, you know, have those discussions about how the day was to calm them down, all those mm-hmm. good things. Um, so a lot of times, as you can imagine, I'll fall asleep in one of their beds, um, usually for like an hour or so, and then becomes the uh, transition to my bed. So I try to be in bed and asleep by call it 1030, 10 to 1030 range with a lot of times I'm falling asleep with one of the kids for almost an hour. And then that's like, it never fails. Um, and because when you run so hard during the day, even though I have that energy to put them to bed, as soon as you lay down and try and get comfortable, it's like it, your, your brain just shifts to off. And next thing you know, you're falling asleep. So um, I am not a night person whatsoever. And it's, um, you know, very difficult for me to stay even out late because I'm constantly thinking about my next morning. Um, that's what drives me. That's what fuels me, even on weekends, even on vacation. Um, matter of fact, vacations, for me, the mornings are even more important because I feel like I can really enjoy those mornings without having to think about what's going to happen that day other than spending time with my family. Um, so that kind of sums up you know, how I look at A, going to bed, and then sleep. I do value sleep. I know I don't get enough of it. Um, ideally, it's seven to eight hours, which I fully embrace sleep as a recovery tool. Um, and so I try my best, but it's very difficult to get those hours. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Now, to shift gears a bit and get to the heart of this podcast, um, like you know, we talk about hard things. We talk about yeah all sorts of of hard things. And while I think I have an idea of what the hardest thing you've ever done on purpose is, I don't know what the hardest thing that you've had to handle is. So the thing that you did not get to choose for yourself, what is that for you? What's the hardest thing you've ever had to handle that you didn't choose? Sure. So great question. And, you know, I think we're going through it as a family right now, um, which has been unexpected and something you never anticipate going into parenthood um but as you know the children get older you start to discover and come across real life situations um even with your kids that you never anticipate maybe you never went through it yourself or you never expected it to happen to you so um with my twins you know it's a boy and a girl and uh boys are so much easier really at this stage of life nine-year-olds i mean my son's just getting into sports over the past year, passionate. Like a year ago, 
couldn't get him to watch anything with me other than like a few seconds of a game. Now he's like, Dad, let, let's watch Sports Center top ten. Like, what did the Phillies do? You know, it, it, we just got back from a road trip, obviously in Colorado. We stopped by. I don't know, four baseball stadiums uh, over the time we were there and had catches at each one of them. And for me, that's like, you know, life. Right. Um, and then my daughter, his sister, a little bit more emotional. Um, she's aging quicker, you know, maturing sooner than my son is. So it's like a balance of those two worlds. And, you know, unfortunately, um, and I say it's unfortunately because I never expected this, that in second or third grade, there will be so much girl drama um, amongst her and her peers where it's almost like a type of bullying. Um, there's there's any given day during the school year, there was posturing for who would be sort of like the alpha girl in the group. And what end, ends up happening, unfortunately, is my daughter, um, because she's so passionate and she's so loving and caring, she takes everything to heart. Um, and with that, there was a lot of hard days. Um, so it's not like a hard thing to accomplish. It's just a whole lot of hard days emotionally and trying to make sure that her soul and uh, her heart is taken care of. Um, so much so that in our little town of Haddon Heights, which is small, there's three schools, um, elementary schools, and we actually had to make the decision to move her from one school to the to another school just for a fresh change, um, give her a new outlook, a new perspective. Um, and, you know, we had to enter into counseling for her, um, which we attend. And the things you hear coming out of that are not the things you hear at home. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are the hard, hardest things, right? Because it's hard to hear. It's hard to digest. And then it's hard to know how to handle it. Um, because as sort of a, a, a man that I believe I am, which is I have control um, and I know how to fix things. Like, this is where I need to put my guard down. I cannot fix this. There's nothing I can do that says, all right, let's figure this out together and let's fix it. Nope. This is like a totally new transition in life where I need to be patient. I need to be empathetic. I need to listen. And I need to meet her where she is at. And um, not that that's hard for me to do, but it's hard for me to witness. And it's hard for me to kind of pull the reins back and and try something different emotionally in life so um it's probably not the hard thing that you expected or it's not what i expected but um but we're getting through it as a family and uh it's getting better but it certainly has been hard i one can't imagine what that feels like um two i think one of my biggest hidden fears and this is crazy because i'm not a parent uh right. I'm, a, I'm a dog dad but it's different um yep. I always thought, you know, one day uh, when you have kids and you have to let them go and they go to school and they're around these other people and you can't control that, that terrifies me, terrifies yeah. me. And I'm not even there yet. And right. so what is what does that do to you on the inside when you hear these things and you see her hurt and you know that you can't change that? Sure. Yeah, it's a great question. Um so because I have three and they're all relatively in the same age group when it comes to school, um, every day is a different adventure on the feedback we get from them. My youngest daughter and my son, it's relatively the same. It's low key. Really, it's it's we're trying to get more information out of them on a day to day um, on friends, on things they're learning, activities they like. And then, and, you know, my, my oldest daughter. Um, that's that's the part where it's like okay at pickup each day okay what are we expecting here like what's coming at us because it, it has nothing to do with um you know things in this in the classroom really there's no interference with that yes i would say there's a bit of a uh, attention um seeking and even maybe an attention disorder because of what's surrounding her which then takes away from academics right so that's something that has to be addressed and and that's something where we can put structure into place um so knowing that is helpful because i'm great with structure um and and there's non-negotiables with that and, she, and my daughter understands like hey like if math is behind this is what we're going to do at night um and yes we have to do some battling to get on pace with that but but we do that um, it's the other side of it. It's okay. What happened on the playground today? Mm -hmm. You know, what did one of the girls say to you that made you upset? 
Um, and then, you know, it's the other side, which is the parent side, because you start to think about it and you're like, if these girls are acting like this on the playground, what are they seeing and hearing at home? You know, and we're in a small town where you cross paths with with other parents day to day between sports, between the pool, between going to a local restaurant or a local store. Um, and a lot of times I know the parents and I'm like, wow, like the parents are great. Like, where is the daughter learning this or why is she acting like this? So those are some of the, the daily parts of when they're in school that it's difficult. Yeah. Uh, so I have a couple thoughts. One is last year I went to speak at a local middle school and I spoke on the topics of overcoming adversity and perspective and gratitude, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of things that are near and dear to my heart. And at the end of my talk, there was a time for question and answer. And so I was prepared to answer anything and everything about my story, uh, the topics I spoke about. And to my shock, uh, nine out of every 10 questions were about bullying. Um, mm -hmm. and, and these, these kids, these, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old children were asking me these deep questions about bullying. Uh, and, and it really broke my heart. Um, and again, I had no connection to these kids and, and it really affected me emotionally. Um, yep. and so I just want to say, I think that it is a problem and that I'm sure there's a parent out there listening to this who can relate on a deep level to what you're expressing. Uh, and then on the flip side, I had this experience when I was in middle school, nothing to do with bullying, but I was in this honors geometry class and I came home after my first quiz and I got a D and I'd never gotten anything below an A all throughout elementary school and, you know, beginning of middle school. And so it, it really, it knocked my confidence down a few levels and came home crying to my mom. And I said, I want to drop down to regular geometry. And she said, sure, honey, that's fine. You know, we'll drop down to regular. And then I went up to my room and I heard my dad get home after a long day in New York city. He commuted home a couple hours. He was tired, I'm sure. And I heard him talk to my mom. And then I heard his footsteps come up the stairs to my <laughs> room. And he said, uh, you're absolutely not dropping down to regular geometry. He said, we're going to figure it out. And I remember after that long day of work, he got down on my bedroom floor and he relearned geometry with me and showed me that it was possible to do that. And while relearning geometry and being there for your daughter in this circumstance are different things on some levels, I think being there as a parent and having those moments of support are invaluable and timeless. And I say that because I'm sure one day down the road, whether it's five years, 10 years, 20 years, She'll look back and she'll be incredibly grateful for the way that, you know, you and your wife have been there for her, I'm sure. Yeah. And that's the hope, right? Like, that's what we live, breathe and, and love about her um, and all the kids, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things where you're going through life and, and then all of a sudden you get this major curve, like hanging curveball that was not expected. Um, and it's like reality hit. Like you, you, time goes by so fast. You always hear that. Like you have to really stop and enjoy those times with your family, your spouse, your children, because time goes by so fast. And then, you know, when you have moments of, um, of challenges, it makes it, you make, it makes the, the, the swiftness of time even faster because you look back and you're like, okay, this wasn't occurring even a year ago. Like what happened? You know? Um, and a lot of times it causes self-reflection. Because it's like, were there opportunities we missed? Was there something we were not privy to that we should have been? Um, yeah, because you want to look cover all angles, right? But at the end of the day, we we say, all right, like we're doing the best that we can. Um, sometimes you have to reach out for help. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm a prideful person. You know, I I'm not one to say I need counseling or or, or would want that for my children but had to realize like that was a necessary need. Um, and we still to this day hope it's helping, right? It's opening up more days, more days of communication. Um, but we're going to continue to go through it until like it's a level set for her. And, and like I said, we're starting school like New Jersey, where we live, we start next week, which would be, um, you know, the week after Labor Day. Um, and it's going to be a fresh start. So, you know, it's, it's to be determined how that's going to play out, but we think it's the best route. 
Sure, sure. So this is a bit of a selfish question, but I'm imagining there are days where you get up early, you do your workout, you get online after dropping the kids off for school, and you've got a busy day of work, and you're, you're, you've got your evening planned out, and maybe even still some more work to do, and then the kids get home from school, and everything is thrown off course um, because of whatever happened at school. How do you handle that? How do you navigate your plans getting thrown off? I'm sure time and time and time again. Uh, how do you compartmentalize and, and deal with that? Yeah, I mean, that's um, honestly a weakness of mine. So I, I don't always fare well, um, especially when it's one of those times where I'm either coming out of a Zoom call, um, entering notes from a meeting, um, preparing a proposal. And next thing you know, I hear, you know, the footsteps and I hear the screaming and I hear the yelling or I hear some sort of bickering or fighting. My emotionally uh, driven reaction is to be like, yell and say, be quiet, because I'm trying to finish up before dinner or anything else. So, um, you know, the nice thing about the communication between my wife and I is that we try to check each other. So if I'm getting a little bit too heated, I'm speaking too nasty um i'm loud i'm just i'm not being very nice she'll call me out on it and and i do the same for her we don't always want to hear it um especially in the heat of the moment but um it's that time of trying to rewind and so one of the things i try to do and i don't do this enough but this is a good reminder daily breath work and so even if it's just in the morning or if it's hey i know they're gonna want be here by 5 p.m and I have that 30 minute window, like, let me stop and just get my body and my heart rate really low um, and get my mind more focused. So that way, when the chaos comes back into the house, like I don't have to get angry and yell, I can just be more open to it and speak more rationally. Because children are like anybody else. If you speak to somebody rationally, typically, you're going to get a rational response back. Um, if you elevate situations, you're typically going to cause the other party to elevate even more. Um, and then when does that end? Right. So, yeah, I mean, it's a weakness of mine. Um, it, it, it's constantly something I'm trying to work on. And uh, it's a continuous work in process. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing. And, and I think that the fact that you're aware of it, the fact that you're working on it, the fact that you and your wife can communicate to one another and provide feedback and checks and balances in that area is amazing because we don't all have that. You know, not everybody listening to this podcast has a significant other or has that other person there in their life who can call them out when those things are happening. And so I think this is a nice reminder for everyone to check the energy that we're bringing to situations, especially when we're in the midst of chaos, um, to be a little bit more calm. So yeah, totally. Yeah. With that being said, Mike, this is the meat and potatoes of the conversation in my mind. And yep. I'm curious if this is where you're going to take it, but I'll ask the question and we'll see where you go. Uh, what is the hardest thing that you've ever done on purpose and why have you done that thing? Yeah. So I think the hardest thing I did, and, and this is a little bit of a curveball for you. I actually did a squat every day challenge. And this was about six years ago. I was introduced to a gentleman named Corey Gregory. Uh, Corey is the uh, founder of Max Effort Muscle. It's a supplement company based out of Columbus, Ohio. He used to work for Muscle Farm. So I don't know if you remember Muscle Farm. You know, they had the big green tubs. They actually had Arnold Schwarzenegger on it that was sold in like Sam's Club and Costco. Corey, who's the same age as myself and 45 years old, um, he cold called Arnold Schwarzenegger. And literally took him 30 different times calling into Arnold or his agent just to get a meeting with him. And this is going back about eight years ago. Um, and when I was working for a company called Penn Capital Management, which was a small cap investment firm, um, we were looking at Muscle Farm as a potential uh, investment at that time. And so um, I was technically on the sales and marketing side. And so I was tasked to go out and meet with Corey since he was their CMO, chief marketing officer. Um, and my meeting with him was at his gym called the old school gym in Pataskala, Ohio. So through that and then getting into, you know, squatting and becoming a daily part of my regime, 
Um, I did it for 365 days, did not miss one day. And it's a conjugate method. So you do a different variation every day and you work up to a one rep max for that given variation and for that given day. Um, so it could be as simple as you're starting out with a bar, 95 pounds, 135, 225, up to your prescribed um, amount that day. And you could be done your squat session in 20 minutes, right? And then you move on to whatever else you're going to do that day. Um, but to stay committed to it, and, and I'll be honest, I was sick during two of the days, like had the flu, was down and out, and I did air squats those days. So technically 200 air squats counts as a day to continue the streak, right? So I had those two days where I couldn't even put weight on my back, um, but I did the full year. and it's not just growth in, in in being able to squat better form more weight it really was the mental challenge getting up every day getting under a bar putting weight on that bar through your fatigue through your soreness through your mind of not wanting to do it but knowing you've committed to this streak sort of like your run streak right mm -hmm. you're committing to a streak and you don't want to let that streak go um, and, and, and this all ties into running because I did this and I, and I went over 365 days. I, I don't remember which day I ended up stopping it because it just became part of my life. And, and when I stopped doing the daily squatting, it still became a three to five day a week part of my regime. And I would always be a warm up to whatever my main lift was that particular day. Um, and it could have been just a day where you're doing GPP general physical preparedness, where your work and accessories, but I still squatted first, right? Um, but it just taught me so much, especially with my kids. Like they were super young at that time, but they still saw me getting under a bar outside of my driveway every single morning. I'd let them hang on the bar like a jungle gym. And um, I would explain to them like, this is why I'm out here every morning, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not to be stronger physically. Like this is all about obedience, consistency, and building that mental drive, yes, it's going to make me stronger, but that's not the point of doing it. And so when COVID hit, and this is the transition I think you were probably looking for, when COVID hit and the gyms were no longer open, it was like, all right, we'll see you in two weeks. Like that's literally what, what I said to my normal 5 a.m. crew, see you guys in two weeks. And then obviously we know what that turned into. And so, yes, I had some equipment at my house. But it wasn't the same. You know, it's not it's not the same as actually physically going somewhere with people that you bond with. And, um, you know, they all have the same mindset and drive. So I literally said, let me go to the track and test my fitness to see how fit I really am. Right. Because I look fit. But but how am I on the inside? At that time, I'm like 42 years old. So how fit am I? And I ran a mile at like a 920 pace and i was like whoa like this is not good i was winded <laughs> i was tired it was just one lap four laps you know at the time i was lunging 400 meters for like 10 minutes one lap I mean, my lunge game was way better than my running game um but the lunge game was was an accessory to squatting right mm -hmm. and so yeah i had that like posterior chain strength i was strong but I couldn't, I had no cardiovascular gain. <laughs> and um, I, I made it a point then I said, you know what, I'm going to, this is a weakness. It's time to get better at it. But I had no idea what I was doing, Joe. Like mm. no clue. Didn't have running shoes. I was wearing like, like Jordan runners, which they're not running shoes. Right. And I had no idea about, you know, how fast to go out, how long. So I just started doing five Ks and I just started like trying to beat my, my 5k time almost every time I went out. And then you can, you, you know where this is going to go. Shin mm -hmm. splints, Achilles issues, flare up on my calves, hips all out of whack because I am, I'm not running properly. Um, so it, it literally took me down a rabbit hole of studying through, you know, the, the use of YouTube, all of our social media, um, access points. And, and I really dove in hard for about a year of understanding what it's like to run. And, you know, at this time, unbeknownst to me, there's this whole hybrid athlete, you know, mantra being built and I was doing it just not properly and had no direction. 
Um, so I was still lifting, but I was also still trying to run, you know, and, and the two don't really work if you don't know how to balance it and do it properly. So um, to answer your question, like the squat every day program for a full year was definitely the hardest thing to do on a day to day basis. Um, and then transitioning it into running became another hard thing to do. Um, so, yeah, and, that, and that's where I'm at like today is the running thing is still fairly new because I've only been running for about two years. I mean, consistently doing it the right way about two, two and a half years. That's wild to think about in the context of what I will eventually transition us to. Um, but what I will say, because I have the run streak, like you alluded to, I think one of the beautiful things about that is you get the chance to show up on the days where it's the last thing you want to do. Um, and one of my favorite definitions of commitment is commitment means doing what you said you would do long after the mood you set it in has left you. And it's just such a beautiful concept in my mind, because if we all just acted based on how we felt in the moment, uh, we would be all over the place. On the days we felt motivated, we would do things. On the days where we didn't, we wouldn't. And life would be this back and forth, this push and pull, just based on how we felt. And that is just so far from how I want to live my life. And it's so inspiring and encouraging to come across other people like yourself who are so committed, who are so disciplined, who are so structured, because you see where it gets you. And like you, you said, it's not just the physical. In fact, it's, it's not the physical primarily. It's, it's actually everything else that comes with it. It's the personal growth. So my first question on the squats is, how many times did you want to actually stop? Were there days where you just thought, oh my goodness, it's 9 p.m. I didn't get my workout in yet, and I might as well throw in the towel. And then second, <laughs> what lessons did you learn from that process? Sure. So I don't think there was one day during that streak I, I wanted to stop um, because the progress and growth, it, it was constantly fluid and getting better as I went on. So it's almost like a fire that continues to build each morning, right? And doing it via the conjugate method or the variation method, it's something different every day. And to give you an example, I could not do a front squat in a front rack position, which is for the audience that doesn't understand putting the bar with your wrist and your wrist mobility with your elbows pointed up, almost like you're doing an Olympic style squat. I couldn't even hold the bar in a variation of a front squat without dropping it as I descended down. So again, it's like that I was already like a hundred days into my streak when I started incorporating those front squats. So it became a new challenge. So the best part about that was constantly learning the variations, perfecting the variations, learning how my body felt and worked under the stress of the bar of the weight, and then increasing that weight as you get stronger. But what's even better is then you can start bringing in bands like resistance and you can use chains and you can use you know, dead stops where you're starting from the bottom of the squat position and pushing straight up and then come. There was endless amounts of variations which kept it interesting. So for me, it becomes stagnant or stale when it's just repetitive, same thing every single day. So for me, what I try to do is find those variations, even in life, especially with running. I mean, there's not a day that goes by that I'm thinking, okay, what can I do different today? my route, my shoes, my socks, you know, my attire, like, what am I doing that I can change it up a little bit? And then obviously just a small little hint of change can make that next day more intriguing. Mm. <laughs> so it keeps it fresh, even though there are little things and more in my mind than anything else. Um, the biggest challenge, and I'll be honest with you with the squatting was, yes, I always did them in the morning. But if for some reason there was a morning I couldn't or it was a weekend where we had like plans and everything else, but I wanted to continue my streak, then it became finagling the schedule with without getting much resistance resistance on the home front. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was probably the biggest challenge. And those days, it was literally a 20 minute session 
mm-hmm. and it might have forego and uh, you know a warm up, a good warm up. It might have been just like, all right, set it up and let's go, mm-hmm. or grab you know a kettlebell and just bang out two hundred air squats with a kettlebell. Maybe throw a vest on for mm-hmm. a little bit more weight, um, and then chalk it up and move on. Yeah. So you know, uh, yes, many times I didn't want to quit. But there was there was things around me that were were pushing me towards that, and then it's just work around it. Mm. And so, if you had to take away a few big lessons from the consistency of that yeah. of that challenge in that season, what would some of those lessons be? So, I, I think number one, it's resilience, mm. right? So, mental resilience, um, working through aches and pains, um, being able to know that those pains or whatever those aches may have been are part of the process. And I met a gentleman named John Bros. He uh, has a gym in Las Vegas called Average Bros, where he trains Olympic style athletes. Um, And one of the things that he talked about when regarding the Bulgarian Olympic athletes is they would squat twice a day, every day. They would typically do a back squat session in the morning and a front squat at night. And that's why their athletes became some of the best Olympic performing athletes. And he said, if you think about it, you know, if you've never actually gone out and been a trash man, your first couple of days of walking and picking up, you know, 50, 60 pound cans and dumping them into the back of the truck, you're going to be sore. It's going to hurt. Your body's doing different things that it's not used to. But guess what? You continue to get up. You continue to do your job. And after a week or two, your body adapts, your mind adapts. And guess what? Those pains aren't really as noticeable because your body has changed, gotten stronger and adapted to the stress. So, you know, thinking of that, it's always like when there's change, not just with anything physically, but even mentally, you adapt, you get used to it, you become numb to it, and then you continue to grow from it. Mm. That is a great, great lesson that applies to everything in life, in my opinion. Um, So I appreciate you sharing that. Now, you discussed a weakness that you identified, which was running, and you decided to pursue running. And I'm going to fast forward this this journey a little bit for the sake of this podcast. And if you want to rewind after I'm done, that's, that's cool with me. But we get to the year 2023, and you choose to pursue the Leadville 100. Sure. And so I would love to hear about when you decided to pursue the race, what your training looked like, and you can keep that as high level or get as detailed as you'd like. And then I'd love to hear about the race itself. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to, um, to dive into it. So while I was running and ramping up my growth in running, I had never done a race. Like I'd never done a 5K, 10K, never signed up physically for a race. Granted, a lot of that time period was COVID and I didn't want to do virtual races anyway. Um, and so, you know, folks have been telling me, my wife and friends and family, hey, you, you should do a race. And, and quite frankly, um, the short, fast races weren't really appealing to me. I sort of thought to myself, if I'm going to do something, I, I want it to be hard and I want it to be challenging and difficult. and something I had to put a lot of time and effort into. Um, And I came across two different YouTube videos. One was by Billy Yang, um, and it was called My Why. And it was him running the Leadville 100. um, I believe it was 2018. And um, it's a fabulous documentary. So I highly recommend anybody um, to to watch it, not just for, for Leadville sake, but for just the cinematography, the story, the whole reason behind why Billy did that race and and why he did the video itself. And then secondly was the Nick bear um, more than the miles, right? I think most of us on the podcast have probably either seen or heard of that. And it was just a tremendous production and watching it really connected to me in the more than the miles, because I'm thinking all these people who have supported me through my life and who I would love to, to have with me, at that race like that's a destination race right and so um it became the kind of focal point of this is the race i want to do so a year ago we were in the great smoky mountains on our vacation we usually do two summer trips a year as a family and we've never had the kids on planes before 
and we've driven everywhere from Nova Scotia down to Disney um, and they're used to it. And so we determined a year ago, hey, let's go to Colorado um, for summer of 2023. And so in December, um, I was actually looking at Matt Choi's Instagram and he, I guess he applied for the uh, lottery and it was the last day for the lottery for the Leadville 100. So I'm like, oh, I'm just going to enter it, you know, and just see what happens. So I entered the lottery and that was like on a Friday. So I'm like telling my wife on a car ride, hey, by the way, I entered this race. And she's like, what? What did you do? You know, and I'm like, well, it's a lottery. Like I may not even get in, but I just want to give you that heads up. Like if I get in, there's a good chance like I, we'll, I'll run it and then we'll go to Colorado. and We'll make a whole trip of it. And she's like, don't you think you should consult with me before you do these things? And I'm like, yeah, I should have. Um, but there was a little bit of a time con constraint. So long story short, I didn't get in the lottery. Two days before the lottery results, I started researching foundations um, and charities that were affiliated with the race. And one of them stuck out to me called the Lifetime Foundation, which is the foundation that is uh, represented through Lifetime Fitness, the gym and organ health organization. Um, and what the Lifetime Foundation is all about is providing better nutritional options to school systems, as well as extracurricular activities outside of the normal school athletics. And there's very little to no representation on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the people who participate in the Lifetime Foundation for Leadville are either Central to West Coast. So it became my mission to you know, spread awareness of the foundation, have a positive impact on my community um, while also bring awareness to the race. So it all went hand in hand. And really this became more of a mission um, not to run Leadville, but how can I have a better impact on my community mm -hmm. as an example um, to my you know, family, my friends, and then bring the Lifetime Foundation messaging to the school systems. Um, that was really the root of what started my journey to the race. Um, in transitioning to training, you know, it started out slow. I did not get a, a, a trainer. I did not follow a program paid for. I, I looked up some hundred mile programs online and determined what would be the best fit for me. Um, I'll be honest, the hardest thing for me to do, Joe, was transition from my four to five days a week of weight training um, while running at, at the same time, trying to balance that, knowing there's no way I can get the miles in that I need to while still going to the gym four to five days a week. Um, and that transition started in March when I went to um, HPLT, High Performance Lifestyle Training uh, with Brian Mazza. And really the driver for going was one of the speakers was Adrian McDonald. And Adrian, um, if folks don't know, he won the Leadville 100 in 2021 uh, as a rookie to the race. And then in 2022, so he back to back won the race and spoke at HPLT um, in November, which I attended. And um, the coolest thing is I got to spend time with him one on one time, like had breakfast with him. Um, you know, we had a, a, a go rock hike the one morning. I got to spend time with him, pick his brain. And it's two, di two totally different dynamics on how to look at training, especially for running. Um, and I just took everything that that he provided and uh and sort of put that into motion and two big takeaways from adrian for what he told me never never have done a race before he knows i live on the east coast and he is from the boston area went to gettysburg college and ran there and he said look you know if you can build up to doing 80 to 100 mile weeks and do that consistently over a period of time you don't have to do any large one run sums like maybe if you want to do a 50 mile that's great but you don't need to um, if you can hold consistent with high mileage weeks and do a, a bunch of back-to-back -back type of uh, runs on weekends, A, that's one thing you should try and do. And then B is get up into the mountains. So for where you and I live, um, Adirondacks and White Mountains mm -hmm. are both accessible. And so um, how my training looked was at the time I met Adrian, I was doing probably 40 to 45 miles a week. Um, I came back in April. Uh, met with um, a guy named Austin Myers who lives in Austin, Texas. He had just run the Rocky Raccoon. He was in Philadelphia for a week. We ran some miles together, talked about his training, and a light switch just went off where, all right, it's time to go hard. And and 
change everything I'm doing and make this as difficult as possible for my body. Um, and I went from doing 50 to 60 miles a week to 100 miles a week. Um, and then once I eclipsed 100 miles, I was able to do that 11 out of 12 weeks. Um, so the month of June, I ran 496 miles. Um, the month of July was 528. So on Strava, um, in June, I was top 60. And then in July, I think I was 53rd in the world. Um, so it was pretty cool, like tracking all that data. Um, but, you know, if, if I draw it back to when I was doing my squats, your body adapts. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people would ask me, like, how are you able to do it injury free? You've only been running for two and a half years. How are you able to do this type of volume? Number one, I eased into it. Now, I did take some big leaps going from 50 to 60 and then 80 to 100. But I did a lot of double sessions. So a lot of early morning where you're doing 13 to 15. And then if you think about it, if you do 15 in the morning, if you can do five at night, like there's your 20. Mm -hmm. And if you can do 20, you know, five, maybe six days a week, there's your 100 plus a week. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, it's daunting to think about those numbers, right? But once you get in a groove of doing it, um, it became seamless, really. Um, it wasn't hard. It, it, the, the hardest part mm -hmm. was just getting up, fueling for it. And, and then just getting out and getting it done. Because every time my feet hit the ground outside at three, four in the morning, it became my time. It became total peace. Um, and then the word is used a lot lately, flow state. But really, that's what it evolved into. Um, and then your fitness just grows tremendously. So my training was unconventional, um, very different. I did not have altitude training. So I did a lot of runs in, in peak hours of the heat so if i did the bulk of my miles in the morning i would try to save some for like middle of the day when it's hot it's humid and your body's really struggling uh, making it difficult to breathe uh, dealing with circumstances of, of, of sweating needing to balance my hydration my sodium intake my electrolyte intake um, all of that became almost like a science project mm -hmm. to see how my body would react um, i did do a sweat test and I am a salty sweater. I was, um, you know, around 2000 milligrams per hour. I would be sweating out of sodium. Huh. Um, so that became a focus of mine. It was overloading sodium through Himalayan sea salt in addition to electrolytes, mm -hmm. in addition to a BPN, G1M, uh, you know, carbohydrate supplement. Um, and that would be in the morning, afternoon and night, as well as nutrition. Um, so it really became like, like I said, that science project of balancing, okay, I've got the miles under control. I know how my body is reacting. Now it's fueling and then it's recovering for the next day. Um, I also had one injury, my entire training process, which was on January 1st. And, and this is a lesson learned where we were in Lake Placid and there's a mountain called Whiteface Mountain which has a roadway that goes up a bit. So I ran up the roadway, um, obviously very slow, but then came down it very fast, right? Like a 620 pace down. Um, and I had an IT flare up, IT band flare up um, to the point where it felt like I had a small knot in my thigh on my outer sweep and, um, and it wouldn't go away. And it was something I continued to run through and the pain would always be one or two miles. I'm like, I, I probably look like I'm limping through a run and then with blood flow it would just ease off right but then you come down off the high and it would flare up and that's when i started getting into the um the hot and cold therapy right got a nice barrel started doing two to three sessions a day um and this is in the winter so it didn't require much ice mm -hmm. but the benefits were tremendous mm -hmm. um heat wise i don't have a sauna mm -hmm. so i would do a hot shower you know, wait 20 minutes and then do a hot shower. But that contrast therapy is, uh, is amazing. And then mm -hmm. the final, um, kind of, you know, st uh, leg to the stool of recovery was red light therapy. Mm -hmm. So I actually, my wife bought it. It's, it's like a red light wrap. So instead of standing in mm -hmm. front of it, you can centralize locations mm -hmm. by wrapping it just an Amazon product. It was like 60 bucks. Um, but really works well because you don't have, you can like lay there, you can be reading a book, you can be relaxing and you just focus it on where the problem areas are. Mm -hmm. Um, and I swear it helps in recovery time. It doesn't mm -hmm. like necessarily repair, 
any sort of uh, I don't want to call them injuries, but nags. Yeah. Um, but it, it certainly it, it speeds up the time for recovery. Sure. So a couple things there. Uh, at this point in my run streak, I often feel like the beginning part of almost every run is me deciphering, am I hurt or do I just need to keep running a little bit? Yeah. Uh, it's like almost a universal runner thing. Um, and then also you mentioned two names. I just want to highlight Austin Myers, episode 50 of this podcast, amazing human and Brian Mazza, episode 71 of this podcast, amazing human. Um, and so it's cool to see the web that gets weaved, uh, through the world of social media and also just through the world of health, wellness, and people who are doing hard things. Um, now with all that being said, Mike, so you get to the race. And I'll let you tell the audience how it went. And I'd love to hear a little bit about why it went the way it went in, in your view. And then I have some follow-up questions for you. Yeah, sure. So I was ready to run Leadville for probably two to three weeks prior to the race. I mean, physically, mentally, um, I was there, right? Mm -hmm. So we went out about a week early. We drove out to Colorado. And that was purpose to get acclimated to the altitude. Um, now I visited Leadville in June. I spent about eight hours in the town. I was doing a work slash training uh, balance trip, um, but I did get to spend uh, three full days in Colorado, ran 45 miles in those three days at altitude, felt fantastic. So I knew that my training was working from a sense that my red blood cell count was building and my fitness was strong i actually ran with adrian on my final day in colorado and this is a funny quick story because i was trying to get in touch with him like hey what what's the you know what workout are you doing and he lives in fort collins which is same elevation as denver and they were doing some relatively flat run in town so i'm like cool i'm like how many miles oh they're doing like seven to eight miles i'm like that's that's great i'm ready for that and then I failed to ask like, what paces they run at, right? So I show up and it's him and two of his buddies who went to Colorado State, who also they ran at Colorado State. I mean, these guys are runners, true and true, right? And uh, and we start out at a conversational pace of 7.15. <laughs> and I am like dying inside. You know, I'm trying to withhold the emotion as I'm fighting through struggling and I can hold the pace. But can I talk and how long can I hold this? I don't know. We made it about three miles and I just had to tell him, I'm like, oh, let, Adrian, you guys, I'm holding you back. Go ahead. And I'm just going to do my thing and we'll circle back. And we met back at like, you know, seven or eight miles total for each of us. But it, yeah. it's one of those, another one of those checks and balances, like check your ego. Don't yeah. hurt yourself. Stay true to the process. Nobody's really going to care at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Um so again, little lessons along the way. But from that trip, I realized, okay, I'm good with altitude. That's not going to be an issue for me. Um, and then when we did get out there, I was already full taper mode. So um, Monday uh, morning before the race, I met with a guy named Daniel Flores. Um, amazing. Another amazing individual who we both followed each other's journey. Um, you know, he inspires me. I think I inspired him in certain ways. And, you know, our first morning, we just ran like three miles together. Um, and both of us were kind of in the same position. Like, ooh, air's a little thin. All right, you know, a couple miles. Um, and then I continued to do three, three and a half miles each day. Felt really, really good. Um, Friday before the race, there was a shakeout run um, in town. Another amazing time spending like, I don't know, two hours with about 60 people. Some were running, some were pacers, some were there representing brands. Um, and that's where I first met Joey Muccio, um, who then I ended up running 24 miles with the next morning uh, at the race. So, um, you know, Saturday morning, 4 a.m., shotgun goes off. Let me tell you, it was the most emotionally driven time between that 3 and 4 a.m. The streets of Leadville are flooded with people, mm. friends, family, locals, um, just cheering everybody on. There's the countdown. There's the national anthem. The, the headlamps are going off. It, it, there's so much tense emotion with everybody getting ready for months and months of time they put into it. Mm. Um, and yeah, I was nervous just in the sense that I'm like, ready to do this. 
you know mm-hmm. um and i actually hooked up in the start line with joey and then another gentleman named mike idella and mike lives in boulder he knew the course pretty well from running the silver rush 50 there and just generally being out there and, and knowing what the course would be like i knew the course only from the map mm-hmm. so totally big difference between looking at a map studying a map for months knowing the cutoffs knowing the aid stations knowing where i'm going to go versus all right now i'm actually running it um and the cool thing was those first 20 to 24 miles the three of us stayed together the entire time like we took gels at the same time together we hydrated at the same time together we would power hike run you know and did everything simultaneously and the strategy was brilliant because a we were doing it together so like the bond that we formed over those few hours is unbreakable um and then secondly it was we were navigating the course together and from what everybody tells you at leadville like people are going to run and and take off at the beginning let them go because you want to save your energy for basically mile 40 through 50 and then 50 back to 62 and i'll explain that um but when you start out your first aid station is at mile 13 which is called may queen it's mm-hmm. a complete blur um, this was the first year that crew um, was not allowed to get there by car so folks had to be bussed into it which mm-hmm. means they had to be there by 6 or 6 30 in the morning um, so i opted not to have crew there and i did a drop bag instead now the problem is when you get there, it's it's just chaos because mm-hmm. everybody's still fresh and everybody's either looking for their drop bag or refilling their hydration bottles and you know trying to get a snack in and everything else. And meanwhile, there are still people there, right, that got busted and they're cheering you on. And it's just it's unbelievable. Um, but it's one of those aid stations where you want to be in and out in like less than two minutes. And that was our goal as a as a as a three man group, two minutes less in and out. Right. And we did that. We, we each kind of got what we needed to get and we got out of there. Um, the next aid station is called Outward Bound, which is at mile 24. So now you have 11 more miles to navigate as the sun starts to rise and the temperature starts to get a little bit warmer. And, you know, I think during this time period, I was good. I mean, I had a, um, a, a bladder hydration in the back of my pack, which was just water. I had two flasks in the front of my vest, which was G1M, electrolytes. I did a acai beet powder extract. Um, and then I also added a little bit more salt. So it was more sodium, more carb-based, more electrolyte-based. Um, and I, what I would do is balance those. So if I took a gel, then it was completely water after that for about a half hour. Then I would hydrate with the front pouch uh, flasks for the carbs and for the electrolytes. And that balance was working for me just fine. And that's how I train. So knowing that I train that way, I wanted to bring that into the race environment. So we get the outward bound at mile 24. Um, at that point, our group sort of disbanded a little bit because we were at different positions in the race. Um, and at that point, you really can't wait for each other because outward bounds where your crew, you first see your crew, there's usually a chair or two. You're trying to eat. That's like a, a five minute stop. I changed socks. I changed shoes. I ate what I could eat. And it was all things that I've eaten during my training. Um, the only thing that I deviated from my training, and this is out of my control, was I drank my water 100% from the aid station water supply. And if you looked at the water supply, a hindsight, I'm like, hmm. I shouldn't have. I probably should have had my own bottled water packed, prepared, and ready for my crew to fill my bladder with, um, just to eliminate any other type of potential scenarios of contamination or you know, something that can mess with your stomach. Um, so coming out of Outward Bound, it's like full sun blazing. It's the hottest day on record of Leadville 100. So it was about 84, between 80 and 84 degrees. Typically, to give you an idea, it's like 68 to 70. Um, so at 10,500 elevation, sun's a little bit harder and you don't sweat as much because of the thin air. Now, heat for me is not an issue because training on the East Coast, I'm well used to it. Um, 
but you don't know how your body's doing underneath the wraps, right? So I stayed hydrated. I went through four and a half liters of water between mile zero and mile 38. Um, I also went through four flasks. So that's probably another liter of carbs, electrolytes, and sodium. The only negative effects I had due to the altitude was my hands got swollen, um, which is common because even Joey and I, as we're running, we're like, our hands, they look like state puff marshmallows. And then Mike's like, yeah, you guys need more sodium. Like you need more electrolytes. It, it's, it's either you're depleted of hydration a little bit or it's just the altitude. Um, but that was kind of one of the funniest things as you're running, like seeing your hands just puff up. Um, so let's fast forward. I'm feeling strong. Like I'm coming through aid stations. I'm running through them. I feel great. My legs are in fantastic shape. So Twin Lakes, which is mile uh, 39, is sort of the epicenter of the race. Twin Lakes is a small town, um, you know, normal population sub 50, right? So the race takes over the town. It's sort of like a mini festival. Mm -hmm. There's food trucks. There's people everywhere. Everybody's got a tent. There's people playing music. You know, your crew is going to be hanging out at Twin Lakes between 8 to 12 hours. So we had to go in the night before, Friday night, and find a spot to put our tent up, which I had my Project Endure flag <laughs> hanging in my tent, which I think was one of the coolest things. Um, and everybody could see it, right? So that was like special to me and coming through and seeing it. But having like 12 of my friends and family there, coming down the mountain, you literally come down a mountain through these rocky ridge. Next thing you know, you're in the middle of the town and everybody's cheering and yelling. And I came through with about 40 minutes to spare between the cutoff, which, you know, ideally um, I would have had about an hour to an hour and 15. So I was a little bit behind schedule in that sense. But still, I was planning on being in and out of Twin Lakes in uh, in 10 minutes, which was, again, a, a sock and shoe change um, to keep my feet fresh, try and eat, uh, refill my pack, because at mile 39 at Twin Lakes, you then have to go to what's called Hope Pass, which is a 5,000 foot mountain. Um, you have to climb up Hope's Pass, hit the summit, go down Hope Pass to get the wind field, which is mile 50. At mile 50, you then have to go back up Hope Pass and back down it to return to Twin Lakes, which would put you at mile 62, which allows you to pick up your first pacer. Um, unfortunately for me, I did not get to enjoy that hard part of the process. Mm. So when you talk about hard things, my my biggest challenge with the race was I didn't get to the point of really experiencing the hardest part of the race. Mm. And I'll tell you why. I got into Twin Lakes mile 39 physically felt great sat down couldn't eat so mm -hmm. everything that my crew's thrown at me that we pre-planned and pre-packed just wasn't appealing to my stomach mm -hmm. and and i didn't feel necessarily hungry but i i knew i had to eat because i can't go eight hours you know climbing ten thousand invert and then getting close to around seven eight o'clock at night by the time i would come back without any food it's just that doesn't work so um, I was nibbling on a peanut butter and jelly. I was consuming my carb drink, um, but I had to get out of the aid station. Like it's, you know, you can't mess around. It's really sub 10 minutes, get in and, and out. And so I got out of there. My crew packed my bag, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, my gels, everything that I'm used to eating and, and supplying. And I felt pretty good. I got the Hope Pass. And as I started to climb, it became somewhat of an eerie feeling because a lot of people were getting sick. A lot of racers were off to the side, um, you know, vomiting, uh, having dry heaves, um, could have been a combination of altitude, heat, could have been lack of hydration for anybody. It, it's an, it's an unknown, but the point was, is that it, it came eerie because I felt like my body was not welcoming calories. And so I quickly knew I need to consume calories i stopped i tried to eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich it just came right back up um i waited 10 minutes kept going tried again same thing kept going and then my hydration the only thing i could take down was water mm -hmm. but the water wasn't doing anything except keeping my mouth dry, uh, wet because the air is so thin and so dry even taking a sip of water from your hydration pack you would be winded and then your mouth would just get dry 
Uh. So I had to keep drinking water, which I had plenty of, but even my carb drinks weren't holding. Um, and I knew it was trouble because it was slowing me down to the point where I was almost crawling up this mountain and moving so slow. And, you know, people are off to the side and I'll, I'll tell you two things. My mind never went towards, I'm not finishing. I'm not, you know, I, I need to stop this. My mind never went there. My body never went there. My legs were strong. Like my sweet spot for this race was hope pass. Like that was my jam was like climbing this mountain. Um, because even though I didn't have altitude training, I've done a ton of power hiking, like up in Mount Washington, New Hampshire, doing Mount Marcy in the Adirondacks, very similar terrain, maybe not the same grade. Like it was, this is like a 15, 20% grade. Um, and you know, standard is like between 10 and 15, let's call it. Um, but I was slowed down so much that I missed the cutoff at the top of Hope Pass by 12 minutes. And so when you get to that point, you have two options. You can go back down the other side and then there's buses at Winfield, which is mile 50 that take you who knows where I, I didn't know. They certainly don't bring you back to twin lakes, which is where everybody is for your crew. So I didn't want to risk that. And so I just basically turned around and then hiked back down. Um, and at that point there was a lot of people with me. Um, it was the highest rate of DNFs uh, did not finish for the Leadville 100. I think there was 37% of the 824 participants completed the race. Wow. Um, so, you know, the hardest part for me was turning around because that was never an option. I, I, and to this day, like it, it, I brought a tear to my eye because I felt like I was quitting even though I missed the cutoff and there was nothing I could do anyway. Um, but when your body gets so depleted to the point that you can't move forward, that's the hardest thing. And so I start thinking of all the things I could have done differently. And, you know, should I have trained my gut better? Should I have, you know, like I said, eliminated the option of race water and had just purified water the entire time. Honestly, there's nothing, I can't pinpoint what it was, right? And everybody DNFs a race. This just happens to be my first race I've ever done. So it's like, you don't want to go 0 for 1 in your first race, but that those hours joe like those hours i'm talking four hours was such a battle physically and mentally that i almost wouldn't trade it because yes it was hard in the sense that i wasn't finishing the race and mentally i had to deal with that physically it wasn't hard like physically like i felt strong um yes getting sick and dealing with that it's hard right and it's hard knowing that my body is sort of my stomach's failing me um, and I can't move on. But what it taught me was that this is life. And in life, you're going to have so many challenges that aren't prescribed, that are not on the course. And how do you deal with it? And what's your attitude when you come out of it? And so I'm coming down that mountain. And, you know, the last thing I want to do is call my wife and say, hey, I'm coming down. I didn't finish. I'll be there in an hour. I'll be there in a half hour. I waited till I got off the mountain um, before I made that call. And uh, it was very emotional. I, you know, I cried probably more that time period than I have since the kids were born. Um, and a lot of it was because of all the support I've had and the people rooting for me and uh, just feeling I let, like I let people down um, because I was there to finish. I was not there to turn around. Um, and you know, as time settled and as I received feedback and support from everybody, including yourself, um, of how proud they were of not just going to the race and doing it, but the build up to it, the journey, um, it settled in that, you know, just that particular day, there was a different determination out for me and, and I had to accept it and I'm okay with it. And I learned a lot, but what's even better, Joe, is like, as I take a step back, I met so many amazing people that week that I've connected with through social media or connected through Project Endure or HPLT or, you know, Instagram friends that you meet in real life or just people I've never connected with before through social, but I'm meeting them on site. Like, I can't even count the amount of people, Joe. And that was the biggest takeaway is if I didn't do this race, I would have never met these people. I wouldn't have put myself through a test and showed my children 
how to get through difficult times and how to deal with, um, you know, not a loss, but deal with a major challenge of not finishing something you set out to do. And guess what? The race is not done because I came home. Oh, well, let's fast forward to the day after the race. I ran 10 miles with 1200 vert with one of my so-called pacers, Dan Marchese, who was supposed to pace me. And oh, by the way, I met Dan at Project Endure and then hadn't seen him for three months, went out to a race called the Loopy Looper here in New Jersey because him and a bunch of guys from Project Endure were running the race. And I saw how he crewed those guys and how he was a leader to those men. And I said, I need you at Leadville. Can you be there? I lost two pacers um, three weeks prior to the race at the same time. and. Within an hour, he booked a flight to Denver and was there. And it was amazing. Like, just so many amazing things came out of the race that the result doesn't really matter. It doesn't define me. It doesn't matter. The growth is still there. It's going to get even better as, as, as a result of the race. Um, and then, to be honest with you, the next day, you know, going back into town, picking up my drop bags, seeing all the guys that I had actually ran into during the race, hearing everybody's story, there was a common theme that between that mile 40 and 60 is where a lot of people did not go further, whether they were cut off, whether they um, were sick, whether they were injured. I mean, it was sort of an eerie feeling, but we all kind of went through it together. And so that next day and that next day after, I'm still meeting people who were in the race, didn't finish. And what brought joy to my heart, Joe, was that there was two two guys I was really rooting for, right? One of them was Daniel. And waking up the next morning, following him through the tracker and seeing him finish that race just was amazing. And then secondly was Joey, who I ran with, spent a good 24 miles with. Now, I, knew, I already knew Mike didn't finish, and I think he made it like 62 miles. Um, and had similar issues, I think, that that I did as well. Um, but I did know Joey was still in the race. And I followed his finish, spoke with him the next day, and just was so happy. So, you know, so many positive things come out of that race. And it's everything that I wanted going into it, other than finishing it. Mm. So I, I hope that kind of tells the story of, of the Leadville 100. That was beautiful, Mike. And I mean, just to go backwards from some of the things you mentioned, I mean, so Dan uh, Marchese, episode 80 of this podcast, I actually just was with him two days ago. He came down to Philadelphia to run some miles. Um, amazing human being. And the fact that you two connected through Project Endure, through this community means the world. And it doesn't surprise me at all that he would book a flight to Colorado in less than an hour after you asking him that question. Um, yeah. Daniel Flores, a client of mine, a friend of mine, will be on the podcast. Joey Muccio will be on the podcast. And so all these people you're mentioning are just, again, intertwined in this web of people that are just pushing limits, doing hard things, trying to find that next best, best version of themselves. And I love what you said about not finishing the race, but that's the only part of this that didn't go as planned because everything else that you got out of this is so positive. Um, you know, I have a couple of clients who are running a last man standing race that's coming up the weekend after we're recording this podcast. And one of the phrases that one of my clients has been repeating to themselves has been time out, don't tap out. And I think that's a really powerful phrase that goes beyond just a last man standing style race. Uh, it applies to Leadville and it applies to everything else in life. Time out, don't tap out, meaning don't choose to quit. Let the circumstances tell you to stop, right? If you don't make the aid station, if you don't make the cutoff, so be it. But you will climb up a mountain on, you know, an empty stomach because you can't take down anything and give your best effort and claw to the top to be told that it's time to stop, but you're not going to make that decision yourself. And I think that's such a cool, cool mindset to have. So I appreciate it. Yeah, no, it was um it was the only option, right? Um and I wasn't injured. Uh, so the mindset was just keep going. And um, you have people who were passing you telling you, hey, you're not going to make the cutoff. Like, just so you know, you're not going to make the cutoff. And not in a negative way. 
but in a way of, hey, you might want to consider going back down um, because obviously you're moving very slow and you look like you're hurting. Um, but again, it was to your point, like I'd rather be told by somebody and know for sure versus not. Um, and so, you know, the biggest takeaway for me, Joe, is lessons learned, right? I'm a rookie to this game. I really am. I mean, that was my game one of however many games I have in the future. Um, and yeah, it was a massive game, but it's one that I will certainly tackle again and go back with a different perspective, a different plan. Um, you know, knowing a course is tremendously different than not knowing a course and knowing how to navigate it and pace yourself. So um, a lot of amazing things out of it. And, you know, the lead up to it, like, Joe, you and I connected essentially because of Leadville 100 and my mm. training as part of the process. Mm. So again, I, I can't look at that race other than a success because of all the amazing people that I've met and we're just getting started. Like that's the beauty of this. Everybody that I've met are just new friends essentially, but amazing individuals. So I look forward to the growth. I look forward to building and seeing where the journey continues to go. Um, and then I always like to say like, what's next, right? Like level 100, it's done. What's next? Like what's the next challenge we can put in front of us? Um, and that's sort of my mindset is I dedicated a lot of time to that one race um, and loved every part of it, honestly. But now it's like, okay, shift gears, what's next? Yeah. So the natural question is what is next? And I'm not sure, sure. if you have an answer just yet, but um, my follow-up question to that is what comes to mind for you when you hear the word endurance? Yeah. So let me answer with what's next. I was, um, I was texting back and forth with Adrian McDonald, who's running UTMB over in Chamonix, France, um, starts Friday of this week. There's never been an American male to win the UTMB race. And it's really like the most prestigious ultra marathon in the world um, with the top performers in the ultra space. Um, so, A, I'm pulling for Adrian. I know his goal is a top five finish, but uh, he could make some serious noise over there. And he was texting me, asking me about Leadville, what happened. Um, I had dinner with him the night before the race in Leadville before he had a fly out to France and we talked strategy and I know he was excited for me, and um, and so I appreciated the fact he's actually messaging me from France. But he said something, and I know exactly what he meant. And he's like, "So you know, what else are you going to do this fall with your fitness?" And I knew what that meant because I'm still extremely fit, and um, and the training hasn't stopped. So um, I immediately shifted gears and said, "Okay, what's more local to me that's still challenging?" And there's another race that I've been looking at for a while. It's called the JFK 50. Uh, it's down in Boonesboro, Maryland. Um, it's a fairly challenging course, speedy course, but fun 50 miler. David Goggins has entered it a few times. Um, and uh, we're, we're currently looking at the family calendar because it's right around, you know, Thanksgiving. It's, it's November 18th. Um, and if, and if, if I can fit it in, I'm certainly doing it. Um, and then there's, we talked about the Loopy Looper race, which is around Cooper River Park in, in New Jersey, overlooking Philadelphia. The same company called Endless Endurance, um, they're doing a race called the Frosty Looper. Uh, and that's in December, and it's an eight-hour, uh, same format. Just you run the loop for eight hours, however many miles you can get, you get. Um, so I'm definitely doing that for sure. Um, I actually like running in the winter. So I don't mind that at all. So I have those two races on the docket and uh, and just continue to train as if I have a race this weekend. I'm just going to continue to focus on that because, you know, as your mindset sh mindset shifts into um, sort of a, a strategic, you know, role, so does your body and my body's just adapted. Um, I'm going to add in more strength training. Um, but I'm still going to keep my mileage up, maybe not a hundred miles a week, but we're going to, we're going to keep the mileage up for sure. And so to, for my definition of endurance, you know, and we, we think about the word endure and, you know, for me, it is overcoming obstacles, continuing to push through limits mm -hmm. because there's the word limitless, right? And I firmly believe that 
is that there's really no ceilings. Um, people have achieved phenomenal successes. I mean, even if I look at Leadville, there's something called the Lead Man, which is, you know, you, you do the 100 mile bike race and then there's a 10K the day after you do that. Then you do the 100 mile run. And then you know, it's like a conglomerate of events. And there's people who do that on a regular basis. And I'm just thinking, wow, like there really is no limit to how you train your body and train your mind. So for me, endurance is continuously pushing those envelopes and achieving your own personal successes, um, not worrying about the outside world, right? It's like, I try to live by the be the example motto, and that's for my family, my children, and my friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I can do it, anybody can do it, honestly. Um, we started this podcast talking about schedules and balancing life and and family and achieving, um, you know, success through fitness and through business. And it all goes hand in hand. But what it all comes down to is your calendar. Like, how do you build out your calendar? How do you maximize that 24 hours in a day? It's cliche. You have 24 hours in a day. How do you maximize it? Well, it's true. You have that 24 hours. Like, yes, sleep's a priority. Then how do you work around the rest of those 16, 17 hours? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a daily endurance race because you have to endure the challenges that come through each day. Um, so for me, endurance isn't just going out and running a long race. It's mm-hmm. life. It's it's enduring life. Um, and I think about that word because of you, Joe, like those times I'm out there and I'm doing a 25 mile run or I'm doing a 27 back to back. I think of just endure, mm-hmm. just endure. I mean, all you have to do is finish this mm-hmm. and that's enduring the moment. So for me, that's what the word means. I love that definition. And, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate the fact that you think of anything related to Project Endure while you're out there logging those miles. Because, Mike, when I open up Strava, when I'm on social media, when I see what you're up to, every time I think, wow, he is putting in the work and I'm honored to know him as a friend. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but when you were over in Colorado and I'm over here on the East coast, communicating with whoever I'm communicating with, even Todd was one of these people. Um, you know, it was wild to track you because when the race didn't go as planned, I was shocked because I saw from afar, all of the work you had put in. And in my mind, there was nobody more prepared than you were. And so the fact that as you were doing all of that, you were thinking about this means so much. Um, and with that being said, as we land this plane, wrap up this conversation, you know, my favorite question is, is this last one? Because I think it, it finds people where they really need it. And so there are people out there going through all, all different kinds of things. You know, some people are struggling with things out in the open, others behind closed doors and whoever it is, whatever they're going through, they might just need some encouragement and some guidance. And so if someone's in a tough spot, dark place, hard time, what would you say to them? Yeah, I think something I've learned over the past year, especially. So I've always had my family to lean on, uh, especially now that I have children um, and a spouse that no matter what's going on in the outside world, like we always have each other. And I've been very fortunate and blessed. And I feel very grateful to have that outside of that. It's so important to have an outlet of community, which I didn't have because I'm sort of I'm sort of an unrelatable dad in the environment of the town I live in. And and I think a lot of people can relate to this. When you live a lifestyle of pushing the limits, staying fit, being good representation to your family, to your community, not everybody lives that way. Um, some want that but don't want to put the work into it. Some want that but won't communicate it. And what that ends up delivering is difficult situations to build meaningful friendships. Um, And that's something I've struggled with, Joe, for probably the last four to five years, is finding community that I can relate to and that understands what I'm trying to communicate and vice versa. So I would say start building your own tribe. Find your community, whether it's through social, whether it's you know, through networking, whether it's through LinkedIn, but find your people, hold tight and grow those relationships. Because when there are hard hard times, 
those are the people that will be there for you more so than the people that may be close to you proximity wise. And so I've found even in the short, even just call it six months, um, I found that I now have a good 10, 20, 30 people that I can go to and they will be open to communication, discussion. Some will be willing to meet, go for a run, get together for, you know, protein shake, let's call it, right? I mean, that's the beauty of community. It may not be where you live. It may not be in your neighborhood, but it's out there. And it's like, find it if you need to build it, but latch on to it and continue to grow and thrive in it because, you know, mental health is so important. And I feel like if you can have a small community, um, you know, that you can relate to and they understand what your goals are and your passions and your drive. And the biggest thing is they'll hold you accountable. I always ask for that. Like, hold me accountable. You know, I went through eight months of Leadville training. Not many people held me accountable. They just saw what I was doing and would say very positive things. But I really didn't have too many people challenging me. Like, hey, great run. But like, why was your pace this? Or what were you trying to attain with this? Or, you know, just anything to hold me accountable. So find a community that's going to do all the things, including hold you accountable. Um, because those are real friendships. That is the perfect bow on this conversation, Mike. And speaking of community, speaking of connection, if there are people listening to this podcast and they want to get connected with you, they want to follow along with everything that you're doing, where's the best place for people to do that? Yeah, I would probably say, um, you know, Instagram, um, and my handles M P Harks. So, um, the letter M, the letter P, and then H A R K S is my handle. Um, th- that's the best way. I mean, yeah, I'm on Strava. You know, I I, uh, I have a Facebook account. Really, I started. I didn't have Facebook until I started the training process. And the brands that I partnered with were like, okay, as part of a partnership, you need you need to be on these social platforms, um, which I wasn't. So I, that's another thing I had to learn. But um, yeah, I'm welcome to connecting with anybody and everybody because through this journey, what I've learned is that there's a wealth of knowledge out there that you can't attain through a book or through the internet. Um, and, you know, I feel that I have knowledge that folks would want, and I feel the same way. I'm looking for knowledge from others as well that live and breathe everything we're trying to do. There you have it. Well, Mike, I appreciate everything that you're putting out into this world. Keep doing what you're doing. I am excited to keep growing our friendship. And uh, this has been a really, really great conversation for me as a person, and I'm sure for everybody else out there listening. So thanks. Yeah, likewise, Joe. Appreciate it. If you enjoyed this episode of the Project Indoor podcast, go ahead and subscribe, leave a review on your platform of choice, and share this episode with a friend. It helps us get more conversations like this out to more people like you. We appreciate you and we'll talk to you next time. And one more thing, if you're looking for a community of people all striving to be better together, check out the Project Indoor Hard Things Club. The link is in the description below. We'd love to have you.